Hey guys, it's Mitch. How's it going? We're going back to the Ultraverse now. We're taking a look at probably the most recognizable of Malibu's heroes. We're looking at Prime number one today. So just before we get into it, if you enjoy the channel, if you feel like you might want to help out a little bit, go subscribe to my Patreon. Links are in the description. Gives you early access to everything I do. Helps out the channel. Helps to buy new comics. So I'm going to get started here. Like everybody knows the deal, Malibu has been around for a few years now, and it's the kind of amalgamated... Uh, comics from uh, Eternity Comics and Air Cell Comics, a whole bunch of smaller press that were kind of floating around in the late 80s. And they have made a deal with Image Comics, the newly departed from Marvel creators, to help them publish their new books, get them set up. And I think probably around this time is when Image started separating itself from Malibu and just going on its own. So Malibu had a hole to fill. Their own comics, I'm sure, weren't really getting it done. So we're talking like The Protectors, Airman, uh, The Arrow, I guess. All of which could best be described as like third or fourth tier kind of comics. But in 1993, they decided to expand to the Ultraverse. And uh, one of the big things about the Ultraverse is that they've all of a sudden got a whole bunch of like real talent that they can work with. So somebody had a whole bunch of cash that they flushed into this. I don't know if it was a particularly profitable deal that they had going with Image while they were publishing them. I have to guess maybe at least a little bit. But they decided they were going to try to make a go at being one of the few big publishers left. Because, I mean, around this time, there's Marvel, there's DC, there's Image coming up as a big player, and there's Valiant. And then there's everybody else. And you don't want to get lumped in with the everybody else because they last maybe a year or two and then they fade out again. So they hired a whole bunch of guys. Uh, there's a few names in here I didn't recognize who I don't think turned into anything, but there's also a bunch of guys who were kind of up-and-comers around the time. So like Terry Dodson, uh, Aaron Lepresti, and Derek Robertson were all lumped in with those. And then they brought in a few guys who were like seasoned pros, who were maybe never the number one guy. Well, at least one guy was the number one guy. But um, a bunch of guys who could be number one guys in the right company. So there we're talking Kevin McGuire, we're talking... George Perez, and we're talking Norm Brayfogle, who's going to draw Prime. So yeah, kind of a wild mix of talent, really, in the Ultraverse, at least in the early going. Uh, Norm Brayfogle's a guy I was never super familiar with, but of the Batman artists, he's one of the ones I liked, and there weren't a lot of those. It's pretty much him and Kelly Jones. I came up at a time where there was a whole lot of Jim Aparo, so I was under the impression Batman was boring. My bad. But Brayfogle's a different kind of guy. Brayfogle has a very definite style. He's got a lot of flair, and he does still have a lot of basics, but he knows how to kind of amp his shit up to make it more exciting. I uh, One of the earlier comics I remember having, before I really got into them full time, was some of the Detective Comics stuff with uh, the Mud Pack, and uh, that shit stuck with me. That was some pretty great looking shit. So Norm Brayfogle is the co-creator on Prime. Prime is probably, like I said, the most recognizable of the old Ultraverse characters. If you haven't read it, like I hadn't up until now, you might think Prime is their Superman. He's not. He's their Captain Marvel. And not Jim Starlin Captain Marvel. I mean, like Shazam Captain Marvel. So let's take a look at this. We can start with the cover. Uh, this kind of cover is fine for an issue one. It does borderline on being almost too cheesy. You know, like it's basically a character sketch. But that's okay because it's kind of offset by just how insane the character's physique is. So, like, this is beyond bodybuilder. This is, like almost parodying what the current trend is for muscle guys in 1993. And it may not even be a matter of almost. That might be what uh, Bray Folk was going for. But, you know, it's great figure work. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a solid pose. And I'm seeing a focus on primary colors and kind of realizing the character's name Prime, so maybe that's intentional. But, yeah, I mean, like, solid and, like, way beyond what Malibu was able to put out, like, a year or so ago, apart from something by uh, S. Clark Hobaker. All right, so this is prime time, prime number one. This is going to be written by Len Straczewski and Gerard Jones, who I think wrote a few of the Ultraverse titles. Norm Brayfogle is the artist on this one, so pencils and inks. That's always interesting, at least. Lettered by somebody and colored by Paul Mouts. He's still there. I'm pretty sure he was coloring at Malibu for the Protector. So that's, yeah, that's interesting. And we're going to start out with a big splash of prime threatening some guy. And this is actually, turns out, a gym teacher. And just getting right up in his face, being all super muscly and veiny. That's a good, solid opening. Uh, some nice feathering going on with the with the brush. This looks like it is largely inked with a brush. So I want to keep an eye on just how detailed 
uh, Bray Fogle's work is on this. And it says here, created by, oh, Bob Jacob, Gerard Jones, and Len Strasuski. So I was wrong. Uh, I thought Bray Fogle was in on the creation on this. I guess not. And yeah, we got a big double page splash of Prime threatening just this normal guy. Although, it's 1993 and he has a mustache, so that is weird. That's the kind of thing that immediately marks a guy out as a creep in 93. If he had a beard, also would be strange. Goatee would be acceptable. Times were different. So Prime is threatening the gym coach, saying, I know what you did. I know what you did to these girls. And all the kids are running out of the gym here, except for Kelly, who apparently recognizes what he's talking about and recognizes that he's defending her in this case. So maybe some truth to what he's saying. That said, he is an insanely muscled dude who is undoubtedly going to just splatter this guy all over the walls. Like, this physique is, be, is like, it is kind of beyond parody. Like, look how thick some of these outlines are, too, eh? That's fucking crazy. But he's just a gigantic slab of beef who really should be dealing with something much more severe than, uh, you know, an overly handsy gym coach. You leave the handsy gym coaches to, like, speedball or something. Anyway, nice, uh, it's a nice splash. Like, the figures are pretty good. It feels like they're not quite placed in the right spot them being a little bit off center but then um, you do want your main hero to have a page all to himself and if you can get him in yeah it, it, it's mostly the fact that the gym teacher is kind of off center but you want to get the girls in here as well but yeah pretty good stuff and i like the backgrounds going on too with like you know being able to see most of what's going on in the gym here like get some kind of a fisheye quality that's pretty nice so yeah prime throws the gym teacher all over the gym here and he's ranting and raving about how the gym teacher was touching on some girls. And uh, Kelly here is just like, oh my god, that's me. How does he even know about that? Which is a good question. How does a Superman-type superhero know about some gym teacher getting a little bit too close to some girls? And we will find out what the reason for that is. But uh, the gym teacher tries to defend himself. You know, throws a couple kicks. He does do some martial arts stuff after, after class. And throwing kicks uh, kind of startles the prime guy here. And he's like, oh wait. So he maybe he doesn't, maybe he can't actually fight and tries to, yeah, like hit him a couple times, but it's like trying to kick a wall. So the gym teacher figures, oh, so he probably just doesn't know what he's doing in this giant body. He very clearly does not know how to fight, but he's completely invulnerable to everything I do. And all he has to do is touch me and I'm pretty much incapacitated. So like when the gym teacher kicks Prime in the balls, uh, Prime is pissed off about it. I think more for the insult, grabs his arm and accidentally snaps his elbow. Some good old Cronenberg type shit going on there. The gym teacher goes flying. Very clearly Prime did not intend to do that. And this is kind of freaking him out. And Kelly's still here and is terrified now of Prime. Prime tries to reassure her, being like, No, I am your protector. You should never be afraid of me. And he kind of advances on her, looking just absolutely terrifying. All this stuff, pretty good. Uh, going a little bit outside of uh, regular panel designs. For this uh, page here, that's not too bad. The colors, kind of garish, which is interesting, because, I mean, this is the same Paul Mounts who was doing the colors for the beginning of Brigade Volume 2 when everything was too washed out. So I guess Paul Mounts is trying to tailor these uh, the colors on these comics to the characters, because, I mean, Brigade being more washed out and, like, grim and gritty makes sense, while Prime being more more garish and, like, candy-colored makes more sense. So, it's I mean, that's interesting. I'm used to dealing with guys like fucking Joe Chiodo, who makes everything fluorescent, pink, purple, and teal, you know? So we cut back to the gym teacher who is debriefing somebody off in the shadow. So he's been narrating this whole thing, kind of giving us his point of view on how this is going. Which is actually a pretty unbiased point of view. So that's nice. So at the end of it, um, they tell him that, yeah, okay, you can collect your check at the receptionist when you leave. Uh, there's a couple of people who were in on this particular interview. One of them uh, has some misgivings about even letting that guy walk out of here, knowing that he's, you know, he's going to be creeping on some girls again. The other guy's like, that's okay. We needed his information, and while he was here, we bombarded him with an extremely tight radiation stream. Uh, his sexual urges will never be a problem again. So uh, justice is served, I guess. From there, we get our next witness, who it becomes very clear is a drug dealer. So he's going to tell us all about the day that Prime came in and just fucked up his drug house. Comes smashing in through the uh, the top floor here. And the guy here is saying how when it started, he thought that the Crips had hired a helicopter to drop a bomb through his roof. And yeah, so Prime starts smashing the place up, just yelling, No more crack! No more drugs in this neighborhood! 
So you start to get the feeling that there was something seriously wrong with this superhero. Like, he's got some kind of brain damage or something. Except that I said at the beginning that this is a Shazam situation, so you probably know that that's not the case. So yeah, Prime is, he's, he's like a 12-year-old boy. Uh, earlier, when there was the girl who was, who was getting uh, assaulted by her gym teacher, the kid who becomes Prime is like her classmate, and he's got a crush on her. So that's how Prime knows about that, and that's why that's like his first focus. And yeah, he doesn't know anything about fighting. He's just a regular 12-year-old kid. Doesn't understand the strength of the Prime, whatever it is. This character that he can become goes smashing through the roof of a drug house and just yells that drugs are bad and they should go away. And starts throwing around furniture, just smashing the place. All the drug dealers just take shots at him and nothing really happens. It seems like uh, you get like some gooey sound effect. We just get like this blurp sounds. Pretty decent looking stuff, again with the garish colors. But it works better here than it did in like protectors at least. The glossy paper makes a lot of difference. So after being shot, Prime responds by doing the Hulk sonic boom clap. Our guy here tries to take Prime out with a flamethrower of all things. Prime, of course, isn't injured, takes the flamethrower and wraps it around him. And then does a big old whirly tornado kind of thing, like straight out of fucking Looney Tunes. And basically just brings the house down around everybody. And the drug dealer guy, he's bitching about how, you know, he can't get the insurance claim to go through. Which I believe. Uh, but he did come out of it with one thing, which was a vial of... Whatever came off of Prime when he was shot, like that, that blurbity thing, it seems like he let loose some kind of goo. And the drug dealer's idea is basically just to try and smoke it. Whoever's interviewing him offers to buy it off him for $5,000, so he naturally tries to up it to ten, which gets him locked in his chair, and uh, from there he gets electrocuted. And the guy who was interviewing him takes the vial from around his neck, so now he's got some of whatever the hell Prime is made of. And he does clarify that uh, he's from the government, so we know that now at least. And we're starting to get some ads now for some other Ultraverse titles, like The Strangers, as drawn by Rick Hoberg. Uh, which looks very solid, like almost to the point where it's not journeyman house style kind of stuff, but not quite crossing that line. It's just a little bit too dull. Like it wouldn't take much to push it over the line, but he, it, does, it does need to be pushed over the line. We've also got Hard Case as drawn by Dave Gibbons, another guy who's extremely skilled, extremely solid, uh, a kind of an elevated house style guy, really. Doesn't tend to draw the most exciting shit, which worked, you know, like perfectly for Watchmen. But I wonder how well it works on uh, trying to do like a more 90s style hero. For one thing to start with, chest hair, never a good idea. Not in the 90s. We're used to the ultimate warrior. If a hero is going to show off their chest, that shit better be nared. So from there, we're going to get... Uh, sort of a report on what's going on in the Ultraverse. So this is sort of a, it, it seems like an ongoing feature where you get updated on all the news about all of the Ultra-humans. So starting with Hard Case, who was spotted at Cedar sinai Hospital, where he was visiting, uh, as they say, his ex-lover Starburst, and they tried to, you know, confront him and ask him some questions, and he didn't take too kindly, and he shut them down. This is actually some interesting stuff, at. We also hear about uh, Prototype, who appears to be kind of an Iron Man figure. Sort of a power armor suit that works for a specific company. That was involved in some peacekeeping missions in the Persian Gulf. Which feels like a couple years too late, but I, I guess that's alright. We also got this ad here for Ultraverse number 0. When I first saw this, I, I actually missed this up here. And I'm like, man, that, that almost looks like Jim Lee. Who's, who's the, the Jim Lee clone? Who's getting pretty close to Jim because it, it didn't? I, I just assumed it wasn't him. Went through all these names. I'm like, I don't, I don't really recognize anybody here. Would be a Jim Lee clone. Then got down here and was like, oh fuck, that's Jim. I don't know. I guess I expected him to try harder because this is this is kind of not very good from Jim. He's not trying. He's not trying to make an interesting cover. That's for damn sure. This is like you know a quarter splash in your average Wildcats issue. And it looks like he whipped this off in, like, yeah, a few hours. Not impressive. And, like, what the fuck is Jim Lee doing when he's supposed to be running his company and drawing Wildcats? And then Ultraverse, I guess, offers him five figures, or maybe more, to, you know, like, just, hey, you want to just draw a cover for Ultraverse number zero? He's like, yeah, I guess. Me and the Malibu guys are cool. We can do that. I can go and draw a cover for Hardcore number one, because I'm cool with their owner, too. Just kind of weird, you know, you're a self-publisher with your own book and your own company. Maybe, like, you know, draw that book. 
And we get the instructions for how to get our copy of Ultraverse number zero. It's very much like how to get a copy of image number zero. Hopefully it's not as much of a scam. I mean, it couldn't be, right? We also get a report here about how Prototype was injured at his last mission. And uh, there's actually some doubt as to whether or not he will survive. He got rushed off to hospital. But the company that uh, pays him does plan on issuing a statement within the next couple of weeks. So that's the, the important thing. And then we get the guy who's been doing the interviews come into the room so he can watch the uh, the update on the Ultra Humans. And that's when a report on Prime comes out. And Prime is brand new. You get the feeling that this guy here works for the branch of the government that is keeping track of this kind of stuff. And they're just finding out about him. So the fact that he's got television footage already is a serious problem for this guy. And it turns out that the reason they're talking about Prime is because Prime is currently active in Somalia. So like half a world away. So it turns out that the kid who uh, is running, you know, Prime, uh, heard about some terrorists blocking food supplies in Somalia, was able to find them. So that's good, at least. That'd be something, eh? If, like, a little 12-year-old kid running this giant super body heard that there were terrorists in Somalia, it's like, I'm going to go help out the the, uh, the UN troopers there. And he goes flying over there and then realizes after, like, wait a minute, I, Somalia is big. I have no idea where the fuck I'm even going. But I assume he's either got some sort of super directional power or just, you know, plot armor. But yeah, he just goes flying towards the front line. He's kind of wondering why the other army guys aren't following him. He gets a little closer and all of these terrorists just start opening up on him. That's some pretty cool shit. And he's getting cut down by all sorts of bullets. He's smashing tanks. He's uh, getting grenades thrown at him, catching them, and then just letting them blow up next to him. And just taking out everybody near him. And hopefully they're all terrorists, right? Like, this goof wouldn't be able to tell the difference anyway. Some pretty cool shots. Not going too heavy on, like, uh, compositions. Not going heavy on the dramatic lighting. Interesting page design here with no panel borders where he's just, you know, it, it, the, the panels are essentially just the lines of the bullets. Like, if you didn't know how to read comics, you might think there are three or four primes on this page. But Bray Fogel gives us a bit of the benefit of the doubt, which is nice. So, yeah, he clears them all out. And says, all right, uh, you guys can come down now. There's nothing here to stop you anymore. And then looks down and realizes that he's essentially melting. He's just got goop flowing out of him from all these bullet holes and uh, like little impact craters and explosions. And he goes tearing off to get home. Uh, and before the UN guys can even thank him. So yeah, that is uh, some gross shit. Oh, Protectors is still going for at least a little while. Not very long at all, I don't think. But uh, yeah, Prime goes flying home. He's just, he's wobbling all over the place as he flies. He's got bits dripping off him. Uh, manages to make it to a building somewhere, I assume in his town at least. And goes crashing through the window before he turns into just a giant mass of jelly. Which seems to be linked to the sun, I would guess. Because Bray Fogel's making a point of showing the sun through the uh, the window here. So, something about sunrise. Maybe it only works for 24 hours. I'm not even sure what the deal is. But the kid running the prime body kind of reappears inside the, the, the jello mold here. And uh, when he comes to, he can't breathe and he has to punch his way out of the goo suit. Which is gross as fuck. Very interesting looking stuff. Like, Bray Fogel looks like he's having some fun, particularly around here with all the shadow. But yes, extremely gross. And yeah, then he just kind of crawls out of it. It, it. it just leaves, yeah, like this skin suit, this fucking puddle of goo and just uh, slime everywhere. And the kid pukes, and that's where we're going to end. And, you know, I mean, that's a pretty compelling place to end your comic, I guess. All right, and then we're going to get an ad for Dinosaurs for Hire. Another one for Raver, Walter Koenig's Raver. Remember that? I remember seeing that around the time and going... Oh, he saw that Leonard Demoy had a character, so he had to get a character too. I don't remember hearing anything beyond the ads for the first issue of Raver. Uh, something called Necroscope, which, I mean, looks cool at least, like the art. A graphic adaptation of the horrifying novel by Brian Lumley. Okay. And yeah, just some extra stuff. Oh, that was something I wanted to point out. In the ad for uh, the where you get the coupons, because that's how they're doing the Ultraverse number zero thing, is you know you cut the coupons out of the specific issues. Very much like how image number zero worked. So there's a couple of comics that you want to cut uh, coupons out of, like Prime number one, Hard Case number one, Strangers number one. You also want to cut one out of Wizard number 23 and Malibu Sun number 26. 
Now, I'm not sure if Malibu Sun costs any money around this time. I don't think it does. I was able to find a copy of the cover online. Uh, there's no price listed on the cover, at least. But, I mean, making you buy a copy of Wizard is fucking weird. And goes to show how much power Wizard had in the market, I think, at that point. That they were trying to curry favor to that extent. While still selling ads to Hero Illustrated. Anyway. That's it for Prime number one, anyway. It's not a bad comic. You know, the art is definitely good enough to be like a pretty close to flagship title for a not top tier comic publisher. That's the thing with guys like Bray Fogel. Like, Bray Fogel is definitely like a very good artist. He's just not one of those guys who's the right kind of flashy to be the number one guy in a top tier company. But it's, I mean, it's great for this. This is some like seriously over the top shit. And Prime would last for like 26 issues, I think, in mid 20s anyway. Um, which is kind of standard for, we'd like this comic to, you know, like be a big seller, but nobody's buying it. So we're just going to fool ourselves for a little while in 1993. I think part of the problem is that the prime character, at least as far as I've seen is kind of unlikable. Like the character of the kid from what I've seen is like dumb and abrasive. So the character of prime is also that only, you know, like way too powerful, which does have a, a, like an interesting element in that he's just way too strong. He doesn't know how to like control it. And then you add in the weird body horror stuff, which again is an interesting element. Of course, all this stuff I didn't know about at the time because I was only reading about it in Wizard. I wasn't buying a copy of Prime Number 1 when it came out. And I got to wonder how many people did. Although I do believe there was a cartoon out, so maybe that would have helped. It's an interesting comic either way, and better than a lot of the shit that Valiant was putting out around this time, so that's something. Probably better than a lot of image books as well, actually, around this time. So, I mean, like, it's not a bad book at all for 1993. Man, 1993 had some horse shit. Anyway, I probably won't check out more of Prime, but we'll see if I can scrounge up some more Ultraverse titles. I think that should be possible. So, maybe we can look forward to that sometime in the future, but for this one anyway, that's gonna do it. Thanks very much for watching. If you like this video, please hit like, hit subscribe, hit the notifications so you know when the next one's coming out. Go over and subscribe on my Patreon. It gives you early access to everything I do, from the Blood Force stuff to the YouTube videos before they get uploaded to YouTube, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content. You can also follow me on Instagram and DM me there for commissions, and you can join the Blood Force Discord server. But yeah, that's going to do it. Thanks again for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.